Good evening and welcome back to Friday's After Five presented by Chase. You'll notice we're back at the museum in the Leslie Cheek Theater. Tonight on stage with me, we're welcoming one of our fine curators here. Uh, he is a curator of our American collection and knows far more about it, his title and his job, Leo Mazo. 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 You, you got it. get it one day. Mazo. You got it. Okay, I'll take the compliment. Leo. Before we get into a discussion about your upcoming exhibition on the American guitar, I yes. think a lot of us at home are going to be excited to learn about, would you take a moment to tell us a bit about yourself in your own words? Robert, sure. First of all, thanks so much for having me here. It's, um, it, it's really great to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about the project, and thank you, Chase, and thank you to all of the people who are tuning in, chiming in as it were. Um, since June of 2016, I've been the Louise B. and J. Harwood Cochran Curator of American Art here at VMFA. I'm a Texan by birth, but uh, kind of a mutt, you might say, since then. And um, I oversee the most of the acquisitions and exhibition programs for the American Department of it if that's what we call the different areas here. And um, done a few ex exhibitions, but I'm particularly excited about the art of the American gu guitar. You know, I was reading your, in uh, part of the interpretive plan today in yes. preparation for, for this interview, and reading it, I, I learned that perhaps this is the first time the American guitar will be featured in this way. It, I think it is. It, it, you have to be really careful saying something's yeah. the first. It's never been done before. But so to be clear about it, there have been really great um, exhibitions about the gu guitar, um, just the American guitar, European guitars. Um, one, there was a particularly great show in 2000 at the Museum of Fine Arts Bo Boston. Um, there are other exhibitions that don't have guitar in the title. Uh, but, with none, but which nonetheless present everything you could possibly want to know about the performing and manufacturing history of the guitar. Recently at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame at the Met was an exhibition called Play It Loud, Instruments of Rock and Roll. Okay. This is different though. This, is, this will certainly have guitars in it, uh, about 25 of them actually, but it'll have 95 works of art, paintings, drawings, prints, photographs, as you might imagine. But this, unlike those other projects, surveys the instrument's subject matter in American art from the early 19th century, getting close up to the present day. I think, I want to get into the exhibition. Um, as I read it, as I talk to you about it, a big part of it has to do with the impact the guitar can have on the individual or even corporate identity of a people or of a culture. Sure. Uh, before we get into that discussion, because I think it's fascinating, and many of the points you touch in this exhibition drive home for me, where does your interest in art and in music come from that, that led you to this exhibition? Um, well, um, I've played good guitar since I was in about ninth grade. Um, so, and I've played in duets, kind of midlife crisis rock bands, you might say. Um, <laughs> And uh, I've taken guitar lessons for the better part of the last five years or so. Has it only been five years? Wow. Well, I I've been playing guitar since, frankly, 1979 or 78. But, um, but who's counting? <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested in guitars and what you might call, what are called chordophone instruments, things like the mandolin, banjo, ukulele, and things like that. And um, at a previous position at the Palmer Museum of Art at Penn State University, I organized a traveling exhibition and accompanying book called Picturing the, the Banjo. Um, not unlike the, now the banjo has a, a completely different set of associations than the guitar, but bringing it back to me, not unlike the guitar exhibition, which is definitely not banjos part two by any means, because they're so different, and this is just a very different looking project than that. But they both represent a sort of merging of vocation and avocation for me. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, we are 
in the process of this program tonight, we are going to get to experience Leo the musician, and I'm honored to, to join you in that performance. You'll have to wait till the end of the conversation to get to that audience. After. And you, tuning in, will get to experience Robert as a musician, which people have probably heard on here before. This guy's serious. Don't edit that out, please. I don't know that I've ever performed on First Fridays. Well, Actually, on jazz I've done a couple, I don't think this He is. sings, he plays piano, he's kind of mod. Whenever someone's modest about how good they are, you know they're very good. Yeah. But go on, please. Thank you, I'll, I'll, I'll be flattered. Hopefully As right I'm you should. Hopefully not too bad. Um, early to mid 19th century is when we pick up this exhibition. Images of the guitar um, in American art. You've already said there are 95 paintings and, and visual representations of it. I only expected 20 guitars themselves. There are 25. That's incredible. The collection has grown. What is it in general, in a nutshell, are you hoping to communicate about the guitar that hasn't been communicated before with this exhibition? Well, I think that um, I'm not sure if it's I'm not sure if, if it's totally unique, perhaps I've not, I'm being a master of the obvious here. One of the things that I think is taken for granted about the instrument is that whether one is playing the guitar and singing or whether an individual goes to have their portrait taken in a photographer or an artist's studio, the guitar gives you a sort of license. There are certain things, certain topics, uh, certain social issues, that one says with the guitar that otherwise stories would those stories would be untold or overlooked undertold you might you might say so the, you know this exhibition is broken down into nine or ten different themes which i'd be happy to address yeah. but the connecting glue to all of those is that the guitar uh, in the hands of many musicians and artists is a way to address topics that otherwise um, are not told or not spoken about. I think that the, for me, what I'm really grappling onto strongly with this exhibition is the, the subject of identity. You've spoken very passionately with me in private about this um, um, exhibition, about the use of the term Spanish guitar. Tell yeah. my audience something about that. Why does it drive so home to you, and what can you teach us about that? Well, um, so the term Spanish guitar today is a somewhat can be a misleading term. Uh, in the trade literature during the so-called banjo mandolin guitar movement of the 19th and into the 20th century, uh, and even before that in, in uh, manufacturer's catalogs, the Spanish guitar in those catalogs and in sheet mu music was a way to uh, demarcate, to differentiate the Spanish guitar from the citern and the English guitar, which both look a little bit like what you'd think of as a guitar, but they sound pretty different, both in terms of the dynamic range they do or do not have and the overall uh, timber, the overall feeling that they have. Um, a Spanish guitar really could be any parlor or dreadnought guitar. Uh, I mean, it, it isn't, but it, it's somewhat, the term is sloppily applied. Very often the term Spanish is used simply to market an instrument. Gibson's very first guitar line, starting in the 30s with their uh, ES, I believe, 135, their Charlie Christian special. Uh, well, the ES in Gibson's first line stood for electric Spanish. Um, the Spanishness of the guitar's history is very real. However, the guitar also has um, other nas national origins as well. Um, in some cases, it seems that uh, artists and certainly guitar manufacturers appropriate, manipulate the Hispanic origins of the guitar in very misleadingly exotic terms. And this is in keeping with uh, literature, starting with the novel Ramona in 1886, uh, going through um, going through uh, early um, uh, Mary Pick Pickford films, her film okay. Rosita, for example, in the 20s. Sure. So it's not that uh, ethereal or other a concept. There are many, and a lot of this has to do with cultural expositions, like the Panama Pacific exhibition. Uh, a lot of this has to do um, with politics. Mm -hmm. um, 
the Spanishness of the guitar, i.e. the Western European nature, mm -hmm. as opposed to Mexico, mm -hmm. which didn't have the, quite the same privileged status. So you touch on a lot of things with this question about the Spanish guitar that, that we see echoed throughout the rest of the exhibition. Um, tell me about the guitar's use in, I don't know, representing culture, a, a parlor games you speak of in the interpretive play. What, what do you mean by that? Well, this is one way, one thing the guitar has in common with mandolins and banjos. Select chordophone instruments, in fact, uh, become standard uh, accoutrement ornament in um, beginning around the mid 19th and later 19th centuries in den-like spaces called parlors. One might give a guitar as a, or receive one as a gift, but certainly you would pose for one uh, as a sign of accomplishment, kind of a merging of mental and manual accomplishment. Very often individuals might hang their guitars or banjos in their parlors as some of the ornament. And in fact, in, in several uh, classes of quarterphone instruments, we see presentation grade instruments that are made just as much to be looked at and, you know, ogled, I guess, as they are to be played. Yeah, I think we, we still make ornamental instruments today just to be, which is so sad to me. Why bother making the instrument if you're not going to play it? Well, a lot of, you know, a lot of mus musicians have um, unique lines and exclusive, like you can buy an Eric Clapton Martin, I think, or a Eric Johnson or a Stevie Ray Vaughan Stratocaster and um, yeah. We've talked about the guitar in use of, of telling a story in culture but certainly there are political attachments one can make to the guitar or to any kind of music. How does the guitar in particular and maybe in contrast to like the piano or the mandolin, how does the guitar serve a political point or make a statement to the rest of the world? Well. There are a few rare instances, I mean, there are a few rare instances in which a guitar is, defines a political context. For example, when there's a famous photograph by Al Almuller um, of Woody Guthrie playing a guitar that has, and he, he got this from an auto worker strike, that says, this machine kills fascists. Mm. And what that reminds us of is the role of the guitar as a way to start up or to um, continue conversations about in injustice during the folk revival. Mm. Um, and one thinks early on of people like Joan Baez, Odetta, certainly Bob Dylan. Mm -hmm. um, but well before that, um, you know, this is this really comes back full circle to the guitar as a way to articulate things that otherwise not might not be told. Um, you know, Lead Belly. There'll be a number of works, a painting, a photograph, um, and certainly some recordings of Lead Belly playing a. Um, a Stella, Stella jumbo 12 string guitar with a screwed on pit guard um, and it's with that guitar you know he didn't just he didn't just speak but he guitared if I can use that as a verb Why not? points yeah, uh, points about labor points about injustice um, the guitar is you know taps into um, what Americans do in their spare time, but it also taps into the labors, the energies of others, so that very specific lead audiences have spare time. We, we, we know the guitar as a great instrument today. I think it's always been a very wonderful instrument, but oftentimes it can be associated with um, poverty, with um, maybe the, 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 the traveler, the, the rolling stone who gathers no moss. Yeah. Um, not in ways that a piano, of course, can't travel the way a guitar does, but a violin certainly can. There's something with that with a fiddle. But what is it about the guitar that makes it, makes it feel so much more like a folk, an every man's instrument, than the rest of them? Um, it's interesting you call it an every man's instrument. One of the things the exhibition deals with is uh, who the guitar's every women are as, as well. But to get to your question, I think the relative affordability and the portability of the guitar are part of the answer. 
back to your question. Through mail order at Sears and Montgomery Wards, early on one could get this instrument. A lot of one section of the exhibition, which is called Sighted and Non Sighted, looks at the visual tradition of those without eyesight using the guitar, very often indigent, obviously, using the guitar as a busking device, a panhandling device. So yes, the affordability and portability of it come into it. You know, the guitar though, in a lot of sheet music co covers, there'll be a few of them, but not many in the exhibition. The guitar, um, it's easy to romanticize the poverty, the, um, um, it's easy to aestheticize poverty and it's my hope that the exhibition does not do that but rather uses the guitar as a way to understand that there are certain individuals who there are very few things they can do to make money um, and the guitar is one of the few things. So in several of the images on view in the exhibition works I believe it looks like we're going to have works by William H. Johnson. Um, the uh, Austrian-American photographer Lisette Modell, um, and a hand for Walk, Walker Evans. Uh, there's a certain triangulation, a certain equation made between indigence, uh, poverty, and um, disability. Mm -hmm. If blindness is, in fact, I think a dis disability. And so, again, you know, you ask, what does this exhibition do that others don't? I don't know that I'm the first person to, to, to notice this or to point this out, but I, but I think that entering it from the point of view of labor, and the guitar is a laboring device, um, and the visual tropes for that, my hope is that that's, that provides a perhaps new, a unique, not very considered, very often considered insight into the trials and travails of individuals who have been dealt a crappy hand in life um, through no fault of their, of their own. Um, but I'm also interested in why this becomes an artistic motif uh, in the first place. I think that I think that those are important stories to tell. Whether you're the first or not, it's certainly something that's moving to me. And I, I hope that with programs like like this one and like others surrounding it, that we are truly educating at least one or two. I think scores of people, however, on yeah. the subject matter. Speaking about this guitar, be uh, the guitar itself being something that any man or woman can pick up and master. Well, what what can you tell me about the cigar box guitar? Um, so guitar box good guitars um, are probably not something we want to have a whole lot of tape on. Um, I, I think you might be responding to the fact that there are self-taught artists who have who have done that quite a bit. But this does get to um, the fact that building a guitar is not like building a piano. I mean, it can be hand built, but um, maybe not to the extent of the banjo, which you can make, which in fact stems from a uh, a stick stuck through an eviscerated gourd. The guitar, you know, I mean, I, I could go through this and name the different parts of it, and I could go into great detail on some of them, but at the end of the day, I mean, you know, you need strings uh, tightened so that they have a bit of tension over a sound hole, which in turn uh, goes into a large uh, air-filled chamber. And the reverberation causes uh, frequency. I'm sure that there are people who know about physics who say I'm getting this all wrong. But um, yes, I don't have a lot to say about cigar box guitars. Although I will say that Bo Diddley and others play, there have been well known guitarists who have played um, electric guitars. I think Rick Nielsen in Cheap Trick, in fact, has played a guitar that I believe emulates one of Bo Diddley's guitars, which in turn I believe is featured in. The Dirty South, curated by my colleague and friend Valerie Castle Oliver, yes. uh, on loan from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But I'm truly going down uh, a digression rabbit hole. Well, Valerie, you mentioned she's she's appeared on the program. It's, it's great to have another curator along the ride with me. We have addressed uh, just a little bit, and, and we can address more. But I know that there are at least a 
quarter to a third of the artworks represent either in, in, in image or in style or in creation people from the black and brown community. I think that's an important aspect of it, just as important as the um, representation of women in this exhibition. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, the woman and the guitar and how they feature in your storytelling? Sure. Um, one of the things accounting for early marketing efforts, a market that's created around the time of this, the decade, the so-called reconstruction and then the Gilded Age era are, is the female, you know, the guitar wielding woman. Um, uh, the guitar in the hands of several sheet music pub publishers, manufacturers of how-to tutorial guides, um, certainly manufacturers themselves of guitar like Martin um, and going into Gibson, well into Fen Fender. A number of guitars have been marketed specifically for women. Now why is this? Well there are a number of reasons. Um, a lot of it has to do with certain um, ideas about the cult of true womanhood and what a woman's sphere truly is. And a lot of this, I think, uh, articulates sexist attitudes as much as it responds to it. If woman's sphere, according to a lot of pub publications, uh, the years before and both after the Civil War, you know, the domestic sphere being seen as a women's, a woman's sphere. Um, liberating? I don't know about that. I think it could be a, a prison too. Uh, but at any rate, the guitar is often part of the parlor. Guitars are often made to be played at home, in parties, for special, I mean, uh, part of what, you know, Martin and other manufacturers are doing in the late 19th and early 20th century are creating a market, creating venues in which, in which to play. Um, women emerge as guitar players. Um, a lot of that has to do with the acceptance and embrace of women on the vaudeville cir circuit. Uh, but in rock and roll, um, it's really not until bands, I mean, I think in, in Soul and Motown, we actually see, we see a lot more s strides taken that would take quite a while for Anglo women playing in rock and roll. Rock and roll, for all its extraordinarily obvious African and African-American roots, has not always done a great job of remembering that, never mind giving royalty to that in the form of Little Richard and Lord knows how many other progenitors of what we today call rock and roll music. Um, don't forget that Hound Dog, which made I don't know how many millions for Elvis Presley, was written, you know, was written by Big Mama Thornton, yeah, for, for example, yeah. And you have Richmond's own sister Rosetta Tharp. Um, these are just two of the well-known uh, women who have made contributions in both rock and roll and the blues, which in certain incarnations can be quite related to ro rock and roll. But it really wasn't until, you know, for, you know, rock and roll music, um, the thing that the Beatles did. You know, women were often seen and romanticized as muses, degraded as groupies, um, and male guitarists often gave their guitars female names. Um, it's really not until bands like uh, the R Runaways, uh, Lita Ford and Joan Jett, and then Heart, Mm -hmm. And a lot of Hart's best-known songs by, you know, um, uh, by the, the Wilson sis, sisters are about uh, um, kind of um, debunking, exposing the ridiculously sexist rock and roll music industry. But then along come bands like the Go-Go's and the Indigo Girls later, mm -hmm. um, but they made important strides. Um, one of my fav favorite works in the exhibition uh, is a photograph by 
an LA-based photographer named Sue Huddleston. I don't know if you've seen this on the checklist. It's of a woman, rather humorlessly, looking at us holding a guitar, and the guitar stands straight, stands erect. Uh, it's upright form mimicking the female protagonist. Every bit as humorless as that as if to say, this is my weapon of choice too. So in some ways, women have taken back the guitar. Um, racial interactions with the guitar, the intersection of guitar and race, and music is complicated enough. In art history, it's even more complex, I feel. Um, a lot of what I know about the visual traditions of the guitar in 20th century American art and visual culture are things that I know through um, brown and black artists such as Romare Bearden. One of the highlights of our exhibition is three folk musicians, a yes. sort of repurposing of Picasso's three musicians to have two guitars and a sort of sword fight of sorts with a banjo. Um, but there are other works by Palmer Hayden, Louise E. Jefferson, um, Charles White that look at the guitar as a discursive tool which sounds kind of jargony but all I mean by that is that it's a way to speak about um, to speak about daily life to shine value on to shine the light on vernacular matters so well, Leo, uh, we've run out of time for our conversation. The exhibition, however, for those of you at home following along, does not open until October 22. At least that's what says this paper today. Sometimes things do, do change in any aspect of the world. And I'm excited to take that opportunity since we have time to learn more about this exhibition with you. Sure. I have the distinct honor of working with you on it as an educator, so we're going to be together with this a lot, Leo. Looking forward to that. And we've got some great plans, much of which we can't share with the crowd here tonight, because we want you to be excited. Coming can I say one thing we can share with the crowd? I'd love that, yeah. There will, in fact, be a recording studio in the exhibition. Now, we don't know exactly what the square footage is going to be. One of the things I've enjoyed brainstorming with you and thinking about how to make a pipe dream into a reality is about this studio, which we're going to call Richmond Sessions 22, uh, as a certain nod to the Bristol Sessions from the 1920s, in which individuals, uh, both well-known and not so well-known, um, will come and do short residencies at VMFA. and. Um, and record mu music and uh, we'll make that available. But I interrupted you, you. please I've, go on. I've begun work on that very project already. You and I are gonna meet very soon to talk about plans. Lovely. Plans especially about this recording studio that I'm yes. excited about. I almost gave out some stuff that I'm not supposed to give out yet. All right, Leo, it is time for you and I to serenade. Uh, yeah, I look to forward to that. Um, you know, as I said, it's a meeting of vocation and avocation. Um, I. Uh, a little j jittery on coffee, but hopefully I won't make too many m mistakes. Well, you have me singing and performing two things I've never performed once in the past, so thank you for the opportunity. You're very w welcome. Thank you. All right, uh, without further ado, Leo and myself. Robert, thank you.
no sunshine when she's gone It's now warm when she's away Ain't no sunshine when she's gone She's always gone too long Anytime she goes away I wonder this time where she's gone Wonder if she's gone to stay There ain't no sunshine when she's gone in this house It ain't no home anytime she goes away And I know sunshine when she's gone There ain't no sunshine when she's gone Only darkness every day Ain't no sunshine when she's gone In this house it ain't no home Many times she goes away Anytime she goes away Anytime she goes away I'm your soul.